Hello, I'm Dr. Thomas Hitchcock, and welcome to this episode of our series, Beauty and the Bacteria, an exploration into the world of the skin microbiome. In this series, we're taking a closer look at the entangled nature of our skin's relationship to the microbes that live on and in the skin, and how that affects our lives from birth till death. Way back in the first episode of the series, we talked about the species of microbe named Cutobacterium acnes, which you might know by its former name, Propionobacterium acnes, or P. acnes. But as William Shakespeare once asked, what's in a name? And despite its change of name, you may recall from episode one that we discussed how we know now that it makes up to close to all the bacteria that lives in everyone's pores, especially in the sebaceous areas like the face. We talked about how this species of bacteria is actually critical to the health and balance of your skin. So much so that we'll be spending a whole episode just discussing this species. And that is exactly what we'll do on these next two episodes. Yes, this species is that important to the skin. However, for decades, C. acnes has been regarded as a villain within the skin microbiome ecosystem, as a cause for diseases like acne. But in this episode, forget everything you know about C. acnes, as this is going to flip the old thinking about the skin microbiome and skin health in general on its head. One of the biggest misconceptions when it comes to the microbiome in general is that all microbes within a given species are the same. But this couldn't be further from the truth. As an example, if we compare two different products with, say, lactobacillus, it may be assumed that both products contain the same probiotic ingredient. However, if you recall from our Microbiome 101 episode, we learned about taxonomy and how different organisms are classified and referred to by a shorthand of their genus and species. In this case, Lactobacillus is a genus. This means that there are many different species that fall within this group of bacteria. In reality, there are at least 100 different species of Lactobacilli. So would you consider Lactobacillus acidophilus the same as Lactobacillus salivarius? Don't feel bad if you don't know the answer to that. Honestly, most people wouldn't know the difference. However, while the two distinct species of microbes have some similarities, as they are related, they also have some significant differences. Different species designations exist because there are definite differences in their genes, what they secrete, and how they function overall that lead to this distinction between species of microbes within any given genus. But what about differences in microbes of the same species, as they should be even more closely related than those within a whole genus? This is where it gets a bit complicated. But as we learn more and more about the interaction of the microbiome with our human cells, we are starting to realize that the benefits observed when using probiotic bacteria species are not necessarily applicable to the whole species, but are very strain or subspecies specific. Even within the same species of microbe, there can be significant differences in how each strain might affect our health, ranging from being quite beneficial to a human host to being rather benign, all the way to being quite harmful. When we hear about strains of bacteria that become antibiotic resistance, for instance, we're comparing microbes within the same species, but one is antibiotic resistant and the other is not. And that is a significant difference. This species of bacteria is relatively slow growing, doesn't really like oxygen, but can tolerate it if it has to, and loves to eat the oils of the skin as its primary food source. This species is ubiquitous and lives on everyone's skin. Yet what we've recently learned is that there are some pretty distinct characteristics that can be found in the many hundreds, if not thousands, of strains of C. acnes. Scientists have recently revised the naming convention for a few of the major groupings of the strains within the C. acnes species. The first group has been designated as C. acnes subspecies acnes, the second as C. acnes subspecies defendens, and the third C. acnes subspecies elongatum. 
Now, there are quite a few details about what makes these groupings distinct, which we'll not get into for the sake of simplicity. But we really want to give you a few key nuggets about why all C. acnes strains are not the same, thus why scientists have divided them into distinct subspecies. As mentioned for a very long time, C. acnes was implicated as a, often even the, cause for acne. And yes, there are strains of C. acnes that have a very strong association with acne, but there are also those that have almost no association with acne. So should we really be trying to kill them all? Should we be painting this entire species of microbes with a broad stroke when there are such differences between strains of the species? Those with perfectly clear skin can have many of the same strains living in their skin as those who have acne and yet never see a blemish. This is because it's not just the presence of any particular strain of C. acnes, but also just as important, if not more important, are what other microbes are involved and the way that your skin and immune system respond to the presence of all these microbes, as well as any substances they may produce. For all the talk about C. acnes causing acne, little is said about the fact that multiple studies have shown that acneic skin actually has less C. acnes and more presence of other bacterial species, including the increase in at times commensal Staphylococcus epidermidis, especially in the hair follicle where they can produce biofilms that can contribute to the blockage of the pore. However, we should also note now that not all Staphylococcus epidermidis strains are the same either. For simplicity, I'll be referring to bacterial strains as either pathogenic or protective, depending on their associations with either disease or health, not necessarily to imply that they directly cause either disease or health. This point that simply the presence of certain C. acne strains is not enough to cause disease has been corroborated by multiple research studies. One such study looked to show how immune cells from different people may actually react differently to the exact same pathogenic C. acne strain. What was observed was that the immune cells of both healthy patients and acne sufferers both had an increase in inflammatory signal. However, the acne patient cells were not able to produce enough anti-inflammatory cell signals to counteract the increased production of inflammatory gene products. In other words, the cells of the people with acne simply were more predisposed to being inflamed. This is in part why two people can have the same microbes on their skin, but only one may have acne. Healthy individuals can obviously deal with these disease-associated strains, Otherwise, everybody who had them on their skin would have disease. It's also the individual's immune system that contributes to whether the strains may cause skin issues. Think about it. There are numerous autoimmune diseases like arthritis and psoriasis, where a person's own immune system is not functioning correctly, thus leading to disease. And just now we cited research that shows differences in the immune response between those who have acne and those who don't. So in essence, it's not just a strain of C. acnes that can be the difference between healthy skin and disease, and thus why acne is not communicable. Now, some good news is that there's also some research that has shown that the strains of C. acnes that are present can actually influence your immune system. This research has shown that protective C. acnes strains, when cultured with human immune cells, the immune cells don't become inflammatory but start to secrete antimicrobial substances that are specific to killing pathogenic C. acne strains. So therefore, it's suggested that certain strains can actually train your immune system to possibly help prevent acne. This is something that we're currently exploring in our own labs here at Crown. But what are some of the key differences between the groupings of C. acne strains that make them more or less prone to be associated with disease? Many of the differences can be seen by comparing the genetic information of each strain. In essence, some C. acnes can actually have different genes than other strains, or have differences in the way the genes are expressed. One example of such significant genetic differences is a series of genes called camp genes that all C. acnes have, and of which there are five or more. However, in the study where the different subspecies of C. acnes were compared, the pathogenic C. acnes were shown to produce more of the gene products for CAMP2, CAMP3, and CAMP5, and produce little to no gene product for CAMP1, where the opposite is true for protective C. acnes strains. They produce more CAMP1, but not really any of the others. These are the same genes in the same species of bacteria, although different strains, yet they are functioning very differently which changes how it potentially can affect its human hosts.
So now we see that C. acnus is not simply a homogeneous species, but is a group of significantly distinct subspecies that can actually function very differently. As we are learning the interplay between our human cells and the skin microbiome's most prevalent species, C. acnus, is nuanced and somewhat complicated. How we get along with the species depends on both us, our genetics, the environment we provide, and them, the particular mixture of strains, how they react to the environment we provide. So it depends on the skin biome as a whole, and there is a give and a take by each, a bit of a dance, if you will. When you boil it all down, there are two ways in which C. acne strains are significantly affecting our overall skin health and beauty. And those two ways are what we'll cover in the next episode. I hope you'll join us next time where we'll continue our discussion on this important species. As always, we love hearing from you. So please send us any questions or comments to comments at beautyinthebacteria.com. You can also follow us on social media listed here to watch our Q&A sessions, interviews, or to send us your questions and to receive updates on other Crown series as well as news and information on skin microbiome initiatives at Crown. From all of us here at Crown Laboratories, thank you for watching. And remember, you have billions of bacteria on your face, and we think that's awesome. Goodbye for now.